Hi folks, here we go again with today's edition of our video cast, My Life with Robert Burns, and we're really pleased you could join us again. I'm Doug Douglas McKenzie, and joining me in our conversation with today's guest is Jim Thompson. Hi Jim. Hi Douglas, hi everybody. Let me tell you about today's session. We're using Zoom to chat with our friends from around the Burns world, and we thought we'd share our blethers with you via this medium. For today's session, we're delighted to introduce a crony who is a great friend of Newcomen at Burns Club and a star of all poetic gatherings in the area. Crony's everywhere. To tell us about her life with Robert Burns, please welcome Tracy Harvey. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi, Tracy. Hiya. Nice to see you. Both of you. How are you today? No bad at all. Hi. I'm, I'm good. I'm a... Uh, I've been working for him today and I've been staying at my daughter's lot and left her a wee pug. So, hi, we're doing fine. <laughs> and what's the pug called? Let's give it a name check. Buzz Lightyear. Oh, wow. <laughs> Buzz Lightyear, fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> He's nuts. <laughs> right, for those that don't already know you, Tracy, how about tell us a wee bit about yourself? Okay, so, uh, was raised in Auckland Lake. Uh, I now stay in Ayr. Between times I've stayed in Catron and so on. Uh, I've got two veins grown up. Yen's a policeman and Yen's a beauty therapist. And I've got me and my partner Frank, I've got five grand veins between us. Wow. Hi, hi. So life's never been so good since I became a granny. So Harry's seven. Indies four, uh, Finn in New Zealand is a year and a half, Olivia's just turned one, and we Florence Rose was, was born at the beginning of lockdown, so she's 14 weeks. So. Wow, fantastic. And is it Harry that's the star of social media with Harry's facts? Yes. <laughs> and he always remembers the night he was at the Bachelors Club and some one of the women that was there sung Koori Doon and now he sings it to his wee sister all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. <laughs> and you were born and brought up in Auckland Lake? Aye, I was so. No, I, I, think, mean, I think my colleague Jim was born and brought up in Auckland Lake. Jim that's been the night? Aye. Ah, I wish, ah, ah, oh, aye, so you were, so you were. I was actually born in Newcomer, but my granny and my mother were from Auckland Lake. So right. I, spent, um, I went to Auckland Lake Primary School. Awesome. Uh, and uh, well, that'd be for your time, I would think. Um, yeah, very early 60s, I went to Auckland Lake Primary School uh, before I ended up going to Green Mill. Um, yeah. And then Mockland, because my father got a job at uh, so mine. So, but uh, I grew up in Auckland Lake. In fact, I spent almost all my, my years until I, I, I turned about 18 or 19. Um, Basically, as everybody thinks I'm from Auckland Lake, including some of my cousins. Yeah, and you, when you've been brought up in Auckland Lake, you're right for Auckland Lake, can't you? Aye. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember Auckland Lake as it was. It was a picture to me, you know, the old Silla Cross, and because my auntie Nancy stayed up there, I used to, to go up there, and I, I just thought the place was wonderful. It was a great yeah. place to grow up as a way. I, I think it's like, I thought it was a great place to grow up, and still, every time I go back to it, I feel nice and relaxed. I just feel at home. All right, it's a good place. So that's where I'm staying the new with my daughter, when my daughter's first watching a wee pug buzz like <laughs> and, and, and Jim, I believe you've got other connections with Tracy's family. Well, I, I, her, her father and I were, as they say nowadays, colleagues at one point in time. In fact, I sent Tracy a, a photo of her dad in 1980 when we were on a detective training course together at Air, and she tells me he's still got the same suit. <laughs> And that photo you sent me, a lot of like Magnum. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's it. Late seventies, early eighties. Everybody had a moustache. <laughs> I remember him like that. I, and he was a policeman by day, and at night he did a uh, discos with with Cammy and Lope, who was a paramedic, and uh, they both did discos everywhere in Ayrshire at that time. So, so performing runs in the family, Tracy. I uh have -huh, kind of. He plays the guitar as well. He's got a, oh, what do you call them? A Fender Stratocaster. Uh, and he loves 
foot on the boot with that. <laughs> Very good. Well, well, we've got you here tonight to, to get you to talk a little bit about your life with Robert Burns. So uh, I'll get Jim to start off with some of the questions we'd like to ask you about that. Okay. Just on that, Tracy, I mean, um, in, in terms of Robert Burns, when did you, you first have any kind of interest or, or any kind of involvement with Burns or his works? I was a late developer. I didn't get interest in him until my mid-40s. He was obviously, he's been in the background uh, everybody's life in Ayrshire, for the street names to the songs at the skill to uh, the names of the pubs, Jean Armour. And, and it was not I was in, the, in my 40s that I started to get interested in knowing Robert Burns and Jean Armour. Uh, because I was always reading books for a woman's point of view, particularly ones by Philippa Gregory, which were about like historical books, but like for the wife, so kings, and I thought I'd be better to read about ordinary folk, and who could I read about for a book here? So I started kind of looking at Jean Arma, and then of course I got interested in the Robert Burns story and his poems, and kind of realised what I'd been missing. So, so was Jean Armour a bit of a hero of yours? Aye, aye. I think just because she was just the only buddy you would ken, she's just a normal person and uh, it's just interesting to to think how she might have supported him and, he's, and what, he, what he achieved and how she was out there for him. So aye, I suppose you could say she's a, a bit of a hero. Mm -hmm. Listening to your own compositions and stuff, as I, as I have done quite often, um, it, it would appear to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but particularly in relation to the, the language you use, there's a kind of Burns influence there. Would that be right? Oh, aye. Aye. As I say, your eye brought up, whether I was interested enough at the skill is one thing, but you're always you brought up in the same area with the the same kind of dialect, the same kind of language, the songs, the the stories that folk tell. I I I definitely influenced by the language, and and I, I never ever kent. I spoke a, a different language. I never kent. It was Scots language until maybe my late forties as well. Uh, so now thinking about Scots as a language is really, I have do believe in that, and it appeals to me. I, I was watching a, a, one of these things on YouTube when you were doing one, and I mean, I'm not going to uh, colour it because I'm going to ask you maybe to, to talk about it, where you're specifically talking about language and what Scots, you know, Lalland Scots, or modern Lalland Scots to be fair, uh, is, and, and, and what isn't he? So if you could maybe have a wee talk about that. Was that it's no potato, it's tatty? Correct. <laughs> I'm trying to learn that off by heart just now. <laughs> it's, it's a, I've nearly got it, but I I wrote that after watching a documentary called Rebel Tongue, and it was a, a guy from further north who wrote it. Uh, and I kind of sent it mere in the Doric language, uh, but it was it was really pro Scots language, and it was a great programme. Uh, but there wasn't much in it about Ayrshire. Uh, so I wrote this poem and there was a guy in the documentary and he says, uh, he says, I don't know about you, but I can never trust anybody that says potato is not tatty. And I thought that was <laughs> <the best. laughs> <laughs> uh, So I built the poem in a bit of, and it's just a list poem uh, the way we, uh, uh, the words we use instead of, instead of English words. Uh, so, aye, it's good fun. I like Would that. it put you on the spot to actually give us a, a few lines from it? No, no. Uh, right, so, I might not get it perfect, but wait till we see. We call a sandwich a piece, a purvy, a feast. If it's smelly, it's bowfing. If I'm no humphing, I'm howfing. If I've spilt it, it's tim. If I've made money, we're skint. It's no market. It's market, no dirty or clatty. It's no bum, it's for hooky. If you're daft, you're a chooky. And it's no potato, it's daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Very good.
I, I hope you realise you've got a whole bunch of senior citizens and you come at Burns Club shouting at it one another constantly new. <laughs> I was walking down to Tesco and somebody shouts, Ho, Tatty! <laughs> <laughs> right. oh, that's brilliant. Just before I pass on to Douglas here, that, and I'm no, I mean, for me the missus is a, is a great thing, but I've got to be honest and say through the war for me is, is probably your most moving work, but my favourite is definitely Granny going to transmit. And I don't, know how, I, I don't know how you arrived at that, but I want you to tell me right now is where I'm coming from. <laughs> Uh, well, I'd, I was at Transmit last year for my niece, it was her 18th birthday, uh, so me and her and my daughter and my daughter's pal went, uh, and I just, <laughs> I just realised how old I was. <laughs> <laughs> and also there was a woman in the paper, uh, and she was, oh, she was older than me, and she was up in some, somebody's shudders, and a... Uh, the, the headline in the paper was something like Granny goes to transmit and I thought I need to write it. So that's where that came from. <laughs> that's a fantastic poem. <laughs> anyway, much as, much as we enjoy your poetry, and I'm sure we'll come back to it in, a, a bit later in this, this, this chat, um, is there any favourite poem of Burns um, that you have? Any one that you like more than any other? I think my favourite yin is Tail House uh, because it's just so funny and full of life, although it's got the kind of message behind it about thinking you're better than you are. Uh, but I've never learned to have the hair, but I'm going to. Uh, and it's just, I just like that poem. I also like Oh, Wet Thou in the Cold Blast. Uh, yeah. I think it's just beautiful and just shows Burns that he's most vulnerable. Uh, just in that patient role at the end where he was he was just wanting comfort uh, and he wrote that for Jesse Lures. Uh, I love to hear uh, the guys at the Bachelors doing the uh, epistle to John LaPrake and a couple of verses out of that. I really love Ken the Yin about uh, a spark of nature is all the fire I desire or words to that effect. Mm -hmm. uh, aye. But I don't ken a lot off the hurt. I can to a moose off the hurt and I can, uh, I, can I did ken Tam Shanter off the hurt, although I've not done it for a while. Uh, but I love listening to the folk that do it better than me at the, at the Bachelors. They're great. Well, seeing as you've mentioned it, could you give us a, a verse or so of uh, To A Mouse? All right, okay. I wasn't prepared for that. <laughs> right. Uh, we sleek it, cool and timorous beastie. Oh, what a panic's in thy breastie. Thou needna run a war, sa hasty. We bicker and prattle. I would be laith to run and chase thee, we murder and paddle. I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle. At me, thy poor, a born companion and fellow mortal. And I doubt no whiles, but thou may thieve, but then, poor beastie, thou mourn leaves, I do my knicker in a thieves and small a quet. I'll get a blessing with a lave and never missed. Ye wee bit hussy to and ruin, it silly was the winds are strewn. And Nathan knew to big a nuyen with foggage green, and bleak December's winds and soon, faith snail and keen. Thou saw the fields laid bare and wast, and dreary winter coming fast, and cosy here beneath the blast thou thought to dwell, till crash the cruel quilt had passed out through thy cell. That wee bit heap of leaves and stubble, Coast thee many a weary nibble, and news turned out for all thy trouble, but hoose are hauled to throw the winter's sleety dribble and cranroch cold. But, Missy, thou art no thy lane, and proven forsyth may be vain. The best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glee, and leave us nought but grief and pain of promised joy. Still, thou art blessed compared with me, the present only. 
touches thee, but och, I back with cast my e and full specs there. And for it, though I canna see, I guess I'm fear. I like that poem because we teach, well we teach a thing called mindfulness at work. And to me, Robert Burns discovered mindfulness. And mindfulness is about focusing on the present, the present and no ruminating on the past or being anxious about the future, which what he says in that poem. Yeah. And I just, I just think it's really prophetic, hey? Just, Tremendous. Yeah. Well, we, we, we spent an hour of Zoom time last week with about 12 of us uh, uh, analysing that poem and, and looking at the nitty gritty of it. But uh, I won't cover all that material just now, but it's such an excellent, fantastic poem with so many, so many hidden meanings in it. Fortunately, we had Mr. Thompson around that was able to explain some of the hidden meanings to us. I, but the thing about that poem for me, I've got to say, Tracy, is that it, it's treated as a kid's poem. Aye. And it's very much an adult poem. Aye. It's about a man in flux, you know, who's, who's, who's realises how mortal he is and, and has an empathy for everything round about him, including this wee bit moose. Um, wonderful, wonderful worker, Robert Burns. And I think it's very un underrated as well. And yeah. most people who, who have read the poem and understand it think that as well. Right. And I like to hear it downplayed because it's so melancholic rather than dramatically said eh, because it's so despairing. Again, I, I just, I like to hear it downplayed. Aye, and, and the thing about it as well, right at the start, he's, he's, he's talking about, I mean, John Blaine, who was his godsman, um, was running after him with, with, with a paddle to, to kill it, and he, and he shouted at him to stop, and, um, and he did. And then Blaine later says that when he's interviewed, that um, Burns then stood at the, the, at the plough and actually wrote the whole poem and read it to him. Good. Literally created in the field where it happened, you know, and... and how true that is is down to Blaine's work, but but it wouldn't surprise me if that's what he did. And I just think that's a wonderful skill because I, mean, I, could, I couldn't write a poem if I tried, but uh, to, to be able to do it in those circumstances, I think is, is tremendous. Yeah. And, and unlike, it was you that wrote about Tama Shanter, wasn't it? And about all the research that he did for it. I wrote a book, I in, in and out of Tama Shanter. Because folks say that he wrote that in a day, but he didn't. And I read that in your book. and. Uh, you can he quote it, all the research you've done for it, and he did it over about a year, didn't he? Yeah, well, it, the, the, the planning had started over a year, but most of it would have been written within a sort of four or five month spell at Ellisland Eye. But it couldn't have been written in a day. I mean, apart from anything else, it, it, it just, I mean, there's, there's no erg ergonomic sense to that. No, no, it was, it was interesting to read all the research you'd done on it and all the kind of things that had influenced it. Mm. Mm. Anyway, yeah, you, you obviously know that poem very well. Um, and I know that you're in, in great demand now for Burns suppers, in spite of the fact that you say you, you came to Burns late. Um, have you had any favourite Burns suppers or any Burns supper experiences you'd want to tell us about? Oh, there's been hundreds of them. My first gin was at Dundonald and I was a nervous wreck. I went straight from my work in my glad drags and I parked in the car park and I sat in the dark <laughs> about 45 minutes early and waited for the opening. <laughs> uh, it was, Wally Dick was doing the address to the lassies. I was doing the reply and I'd never even been to a bun supper before. <laughs> I was doing the reply. <laughs> uh, what did you call him? Ian Farrell was doing the immortal day and Roger Livingston uh, was cheering. So I couldn't have been in better company for keeping me uh, calm. Uh, and I just remember looking out onto the sea of faces and thinking, oh, I'm going to forget the words. <laughs> 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 but I didn't know that to my half since, but I didn't know that night. Uh, and uh, it was good fun. So, and then yeah, there was... Yeah. Carry on. Uh, there was loads after that. There was Jenna Och and Lek where... My primary three teacher, eh, Moira Donis, was sitting <laughs> straight across from me. <laughs> <laughs> eh, again, it was Wally that was there, eh, and the the older fella, Hasty, as well. Eh, so, God, where else? Come, Marnock, 
Edinburgh. I, I dressed a haggis in Edinburgh in front of about 200 folk. I don't know how I did it. <laughs> uh, oh God, I too many to mention. I think my, one of my best times was when my pals Lassie works with the Red Cross and she works with a group of folk called the Voices Network and the refugees and they're uh, trying to change the law because the way the law is, the new, they can't work in the jobs they're trained in. Uh, so they've got to be in the, the, the can of work. Uh, so they want to change the law so that they can work in the, the jobs that they're trained today. Uh, and I met with a group of them and it was, oh, it was, it was Indigenous Language Day and Mother Tongue Day. It was International Mother Tongue Day. And they all did poems. I did some Robert Burns poems. I did a wee PowerPoint talk on Robert Burns which no everybody understood, but they saw the pictures. <laughs> uh, and then they all did poems in their own language, and it was dead emotional. Uh, it was just really, really good. So, Fantastic. You mentioned <laughs> Wally Dick a couple of times there, and in danger of um, getting a wee bit big, he did if it gets mentioned again. Um, you, you've been this uh, main driver along the way of getting the, uh, the, the Sangs and Clatter Nights at the Bachelors Club up and running. Can you tell us how that came about? I think Hugh Farrell's probably been the main driver. He can he pushes <laughs> me and Wally. He gives us a kick up the backside at times. Uh, so it was Hugh Farrell's idea. Uh, it was his kind of dream to, to open it again. And as you can, he does the debate nights now. Too. So it started uh, oh, nearly two years ago now. Uh, and I think you're, you were there the first night, weren't you, you and Sheila? Yeah. Uh, and I the the it's to it's for, as it's to get folk meeting each other that are interested in bums and also to raise money. If we, we we donate every time we 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 say something to raise money to keep the bachelors up and running basically because it's struggling. Uh, so we've I think we've raised about oh, over a thousand pounds so far. Aye, fantastic. Um, Mm -hmm. And you've had another initiative recently, uh, a, a wee video that was, was released. Aye, I was dead proud of that. Uh, so that was a wee patchwork poem that everybody, in, including yourself, contributed to. Uh, everybody wrote a wee verse in the bun stanza of what the bachelors means to them. When we put it all together, maybe about a dozen of us. Uh, and the reason we did it was because the National Trust struggling just now eh, and there's probably going to be a lot of redundancies in Ayrshire including folk in the Robert Burns Birthplace Museum and the kind of buildings related to the Trust are in a threat of being sold off the likes of the Bachelors so we'll just try to raise awareness of that and to let the National Trust ken that the Bachelors is no some story museum it's used by real folk that go along and enjoy it on a regular basis. Very good. Certainly, it's been well received that video. It's had a lot of good comments on it. Nice. I think it was a, a great idea to, to put it together. But I mean, you're, you're involved with the Birthplace Museum as well, aren't you? What, what, what do you do there? I'm the voluntary screever there. Uh, so, Rab Wilson was the screever there before, and he, at the end of your three year, Screaming, you pass it on to somebody else. So he passed it on to me. Uh, and again, it's just a bit kind of doing whatever you want today, basically. Uh, what I've done so far is a series of workshops on Scots language and Scots literature there. Uh, and there's usually been about a dozen, well, six, half a dozen to a dozen folk turning up. And it's just been nice wee blathers and sort of reading bits for different Scottish books, sort of contemporary and historical and chatting. But it hasn't, I've not really got off with it. But it's not really came to anything because we were, as soon as I was getting yes to it, we were into lockdown and there's only All two, right. only two folk, folk at the museum just now, in a gardener and somebody in the office. So it's kind of on hold just now. Uh, and I was doing sort of media posts on 
can guess what this word means kind of thing, which was in Scots language and it, and it was good fun. So I hope it, I hope it opens again soon. And I mean, uh, Jim, Jim was talking to you about, uh, about the, the, the mother tongue and, and Scots language earlier on and, and uh, how you, you got interested in it because Burns used that language. Um, how, how do you think the language is doing in terms of its, uh, the, the, the level of interest in it now? I think there's a bit of a, a renaissance going on, actually. I think there's loads of folk aware of Scots being a language now eh, and proud to use it. Eh, and I think it, that has an impact on folk's confidence eh, because we don't feel as if we're doing wrong using the language now. We feel, certainly speaking for myself, that I'm confident at speaking the way I've always spoke now instead of feeling I have to speak proper and ending up talking some sort of hybrid Hoff language <laughs> mixture English Scots and you answer the phone and go yes I'll see you at the hinner end of next week. <laughs> <laughs> my, wee, my wee granddaughter she watches loads of a Sky telly programs like Paw Patrol and things so she's got this she talks when she's playing where we we figure she talks in this kind of half American, half Scottish language, and she'll say things like, Yeah, we'll, get, we'll just take something out of the freezer and turn the space <laughs> on. <laughs> uh, very good. There's a good friend of Douglas and mine, uh, John Mon, who's a lecturer at the D University, once said to me, um, The difference between dialect and language is governance. Aye. And that's it. It's the same thing. It's just a it's just a political issue, right. uh, and it's good to see the Scots language because up until now it's just been or the past few years it's been Gaelic that's been part of it. But I think the, the Scottish government or people within the Scottish Parliament, whatever party, are now recognising that Scots is a particularly Lowland Scots and Doric Scots are part of their history and culture. Right. And I think Certainly, John, John, John Morden taught, taught me a lot. John, I worked with John when we, we ran the Lepreit Festival at Muir Kirk for, for 10 years. And uh, I, I learned so much from John about how important it was to, to maintain Scots as a language. I mean, I, 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 was, I was brought up in Cumnock, but my mother came from south of the border. So I, 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 I got my, my use of Scots uh, criticised at home. So it doesn't really come all that naturally to me but uh, certainly being involved with things like the Craig Festival and, and the Bunch Club, um, I, I understand how important it is to, to maintain the language. Aye, aye, definitely. And watching, again, watching that programme Rebel Tongue that was on recently, the guy, I think his name was Alistair, was in it, and he was interviewing a linguist, and she was saying that there's no, there's no really only definition, just like what you were what, what you were saying, Jim, there's no real definition for language. Can some, some languages might be totally indecipherable for each other, but the likes of Scandinavian languages are really similar, but yet they're still classified as different languages, just like Polish and English. I think, I think it's one of, the, one of the Scandinavian countries that uh, uses the word Sturzucker for vacuum cleaner, and I think we would fairly feel easily understand that. <laughs> That's a great word, doesn't it? Well, I mean, in Denmark, you don't bounce the ball, you stoke the bar. Ah, there you go. Yeah, okay. yeah I mean, and, and the Stursucker is Dutch, and well, it's Northern Dutch rather than the Southern end where Belgium is. But I mean, it, it, it's official language. That's what they say. Yeah. There's a lot of kind of influences for North Centre, the likes of Scunner, for instance, comes for Sconnering or something like that for for. Belittled or aye, lord or aye. I mean, Burns has worked littered with, with, with European language, but not just the French. I mean, he goes into German and Tam O'Shantry says, that's actually cough for her wee nanny. And we say, we, you cough up. That's, what, you know, if you cough up for something, that's aye. for the German verb kaufen to purchase. Right? Really? So, and that's, that's the big issue with Burns for me today in terms of, the, the, it's not, you know, if, if you, what relevance is Burns going to the 21st century? Well, there are two obstructions, and the first one really is, is understanding because the language is so, I mean, it's 200 and odd years old, so, so folk don't pick up on what the words actually mean and where they came from and why Burns is using them. And it's just wonderful to get Scots language 
particularly in a modern concept like what you're doing in, in terms of what you're putting across. Because when, I mean, again, uh, one of your poems breaks. When, when I listened to it, I was wetting myself. It was so funny, you know. But, but again, it, 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 it's of, it, of its time. It's right now, it's modern. But it's still in a, a language that everybody understands who lives here. Well, Tracy, can I get you to talk a bit more about the, the misses? We, we talked about it a wee bit earlier on, but we kind of drifted over it. And I think it's a very important piece of work. Um, I first heard the misses with Jane Brown reciting it in the church at Mochlin for the Holy Fair, which was whatever number of years ago. And I think I've heard from you since that you were a wee bit nervous to date yourself at that time. So maybe you could talk about it and, and how it came about and all these kind of things. I, I wrote the misses, oh, I don't know how many years ago. Uh, and when I first wrote it, it was dead, dead, dead long. Uh, this, the version that, that so out now is really cut down. Uh, I've got the original somewhere, but I I was I contacted Rob Wilson because uh, I knew he was interested in, in, in real Ken in Scots language and asked him what to do about it really. Uh, and I tell him I was terrified. <laughs> 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 and I said, I said, I'm no much of a performer. <laughs> and he, he says, well, there's this woman in Dumfries, uh, Jane Brown, who, who's really good, and, and does Jean Arma. She, she has an interest in Jean Arma, and she might do it. So he asked Jane, Jane, and uh, Jane did it for me to stay away until I worked up the courage to do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, certainly, I certainly enjoyed that first recitation. I was absolutely gobsmacked. With it, so it was. It was great when you started doing it yourself. It was great to hear you doing it. It's good fun to do it. Uh, I I enjoy doing it. I enjoy belting it out. There's quiet bits and there's loud bits. It ebbs and flows. Uh, just to kind of mirror the kind of ups and downs in their life. So, uh, Any chance of we exit? Uh, will I do the labour exit when she's in labour with the twins? <laughs> ah, that would be fine. Okay, right. Uh, then September broke the merciless pains, the ripping, relentless, torturous strains. A croon and a drawing, a grit from a rab, a grain and a graft, a scratch and a sabbed, a pecked and a panted, a grit from a mammy, a pushed and a shoved, a rot, rap bums, damn ye. Racks with pain, tart and wear it for hours and then seeking to lear it, wondering, will I I be condemned to a life without refuge, nay husband at home, just me and my ain with my featherless wain, just when I thought I could take it, nay mare, room of far legs a spa, please God hear my prayer, take my beautiful life and end this despair. I felt slippy release between my thighs, the whole strength of my baby, his bony cries, and then came my doctor, faster hint her brother, my medical lass, and sick a surprise for her mother. And when the howdy hod at me, my brobit bairns, they healsome and hearty, we winners. My pains lang sign to now rejoin, to all gifts be God of us. I hap them in to all cosy plaids, my bony lass and strappin laddie, silk, downy heads and dorkeen wide. The spitting image of a daddy. <laughs> Fantastic. Well done. There's a picture. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely illustrations done by uh, Maggie Bolton and uh, 14 illustrations. So, so if anyone wants to buy the book, they can find it in all good bookshops. They can get it at Dumfries House or in Ockham Lake or Many Thanks in Mochlin or just contact me. If the missus has got a Facebook page, the folk can contact me through that as well. Very good. Well, hopefully friends of our podcast from around the world will all be getting onto that Facebook page and, and, and coming, to, coming to find the book. No, and, and, and hopefully they'll also take the chance to look on YouTube and, and hear you reciting it on YouTube. Oh, aye. Aye, that's right. At Bums Fest, aye. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, Tracy, we're, we're kind of running out of time, but, but before we go, is there anything, Jim, that you still want to ask, Tracy? Hi, I was just wondering, Tracy, what's next for Tracy Harvey? I would quite like 
to get, I'm, I'm, and I'm gradually getting published in Scot, and particularly Lalland's Scots Language magazine, which is a great wee magazine, a twice yearly journal. Uh, I had an English in, uh, published recently in a, a Johannesburg journal. Uh, I would like to continue to get them published and I've started writing short stories as well, which I'd like to get. I could, I've had my first gen published. Well done. Thank you. So I'd like to do a wee pamphlet or book on my own uh, and get it out there. Uh, so hopefully I'll get that done. And I'd like to be a crazy cat lady. I want a cat, so that's another thing. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Well, I, I, just, I just want to say thanks very much for spending time with us. I thoroughly enjoyed our chat and uh, wish you great luck with making sure the Bachelors Club survives and that things get back to normal at the museum. Awesome. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you at many of the You Come at Burns Club events. Uh, you're a, a regular at our Scots Verse Night, so hopefully when we have our, our Zoom version this year, that uh, you'll be able to join us. Yeah. Thanks Thank for you. your time, Tracy. Thank you for yours. Thank you. <laughs>